Well, let's read our scripture this morning from Numbers chapter 13, verses 25 through 33. And let me set it up for you. Um, this is uh, where the Israelites, they are free from the Egyptian captivity. And it's about a year and nine months of freedom that they have experienced. And now they have made it to the promised land, the land of Canaan. After 430 years of bondage, God had given them a promise that they're going to have, and have this land, that God's going to give it to them. And they're standing on the edge of Canaan, and Moses sends out 12 spies to spy out the land, to, see, to, to check it out, to see what it's like. And so this is uh, where we are in this story. Uh, and so Numbers chapter 13, we're going to begin with verse 25, and let's stand for the reading of God's word, Numbers chapter 13, beginning with verse 25, towards the end, and so this is the report of the spies after they come back. So verse 25, when they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told them, told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. And it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites are living in the hill country, and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they, sent, so they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size there we also saw the nephilim the sons of anak uh, are a part of the nephilim and we and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight and so we were in their sight and this is the word of god for the people of god let's pray father thank you so much for an opportunity to be in your house, Lord, to hear your word, Lord, to worship in spirit and in truth. And Father, I pray that this morning that we would hear the full truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And so, Lord, I pray that our eyes and our ears would be open, that we might truly receive and hear what you have to say to us today. And Lord, if we've been following a different truth, a different gospel, a fake gospel, Lord, I pray that you would convict us of that. And that we would turn to the to the true to the truth, and uh, and that we would hear that truth today, and so touch our hearts today and change our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen. You may be seated. A few weeks ago, I was uh, watching the news and watching a news uh, a news station that I don't normally watch, and as I was watching it, it was obvious that everything that I was hearing was fake news, right? And so, but there was a little truth mixed in with it, with, with it but it was mostly just fake news. It was nonsense uh, that they were reporting. And so I want to talk to you today about the danger of fake news. When I was reading, when I was watching that news program, I was like, I was thinking about the good news, and then I was thinking about fake news, and I say, and I was thinking, this is going to make a sermon here in a couple of weeks. And so I want to talk to you today about the dangers of fake news. There's no secret that we live in a world of fake news. And gone are the days when a Walter Cronkite type personality is behind the news desk and he reads the facts, the news of the day. 
When Walter Cronkite reported on the major news events of the day, like, say, the assassination of JFK or the Apollo 11 landing, moon landing, Apollo 11 moon landing, he didn't have a political spin on those events. He just simply gave the facts without the politics. And for him and others like him, there were no sides. There were only the facts. Today, every news commentator gives their particular spin on the news and, and, uh, and world events, and they base that on their own worldview, their politics, whatever uh, worldview they happen to have. Now, the same can be said about those who stand behind the pulpit in our churches, those who teach Sunday school classes in, in all of our churches, those who lead small groups, those who teach seminary classes that train pastors and church leaders, and on and on. Every generation, every generation has had preachers and teachers who stood behind the pulpit, who preached only the truth, the facts of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The pulpit and the, semin and the seminary lectern has been a sacred place where truth, the good news, not fake news, the whole truth, not half-truths, was preached and taught. However, like the fake news media of today, every generation has also had to deal with preachers and teachers that have spun the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to their particular way of thinking. And this is something that the Apostle Paul warned his young apprentice, apprentice Timothy about in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 1, beginning with verses 1, he, he talks to Timothy, he writes Timothy this, this. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things. Endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. The Apostle Paul also warned the church in Galatia about deserting the true gospel the one that he preached in deserting that gospel, the true gospel, for a different gospel. And so he says in Galatians chapter 1, beginning with verse 6, he says, I am amazed that you so quickly are deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which really is, is not another. Only there are some who are, who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. And we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. So I want to address the, the messages that get preached in our churches today, some of those, in just a minute, but I want us to get back to our text, because our text, if there's one thing our text does today, is it reminds us that fake news has been around for a long time. So let's look at the context of our passage. Now, according to one particular timeline that I found, um, the, is that it calculated that the Israelites had been free from Egyptian captivity for one year and nine months by the time Moses sent out the spies into the land of Canaan. So here's what they experienced during that time, the, during that year, that, that little over a year and a half they experienced. They experienced the Passover, the crossing of the Red Sea, Moses giving them instructions on how to build the tabernacle and what to do and all the instructions there. They had the golden calf incident. They received the Ten Commandments. They began to construct the tabernacle. They dedicated the tabernacle. And now, here they are, a year and a little over a half, half a year, a year and nine months. They're standing on the edge of Canaan, the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey that God had promised would be theirs. And Moses sends out 12 spies, 
one spy for each one of the 12 tribes of Israel in order to check out the land to see what was, see what it was there. Now, you, can you imagine the, an, the anticipation that was felt waiting on those spies to return? Forty days, they waited on those spies to return. And here they are, after 430 years of bondage, of slavery in Egypt, here they are, a year and nine months of freedom, and they've got people, spies, going out into the land to check it out. And can you imagine the anticipation on waiting for them to come back? There they are on the edge of the promised land. But what do the spies do? What do they say when they come back? What happens? Well, ten of the spies report fake news. Only Joshua and Caleb say, let us go up at once and take possession of the land. For we are able to overcome it. The rest of the spies, the ten spies, they give another report. They give a bad report. Another way of saying, they give half good news, half bad news, half truth, half untruth. And they do, in fact, give some good, they do, in fact, report that the land is good, that it does flow with milk and honey. In fact, they even bring back some of the fruit of the land. They bring back so much grapes that one man can't carry them all. They have, two men have to carry them on a stick between them. And so they bring back that proof that the land is good, but they say that the land was inhabited by a very strong people. Their cities are well fortified. There are giants in the land, and we're like grasshoppers to them, so they said. And so when the 10, when 10 out of the 12 uh, spies give this report, the majority report is that they are not able to go and take the land. They're not able to go up against what the people that are in the land. Now, there's a lot of dangers of fake news, and one of the major dangers of this is when we hear and believe fake news, it will cause you to wander. Let me say that again. The danger, one of the biggest dangers of hearing and believing fake news is it will cause you to wonder. Now, because the people listened to and believed that bad report, it caused them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. One year for every day that the spies were out spying the land. Now, think about it this way. The Israelites had been given a purpose, a vision, and that vision was to possess the land that God had promised them. Remember, this is the promised land. God had promised them this land. And a year and nine months had passed since they were free and able to fulfill that vision. And what do they do? They believe the fake news. They believe the bad report. And their vision would not be fulfilled until 40 years later. They wander in the wilderness. And I think Proverbs 29.18 can apply here. You're familiar with Proverbs 29.18. It says... Where there is no vision, the people perish. The ESV puts it this way. Where there is no prophetic vision. Where there is no, when there is no one constantly telling you the vision that God has put forth for you. When that person is not there or that vision is not being cast. Then the people perish. Or the ESV puts it this way. The people are unrestrained. They cast off restraint. So they had a vision. But when they believed the fake news, they lost their vision. Now, they didn't stop being the, the, the people of God. They didn't stop being the chosen people of God. They didn't stop being God's people. But their blessing was delayed. And for that generation, the whole generation, except for Joshua and Caleb, the one who gave the good report and gave the, the true report, they were the only ones of that generation who were able to enter into the promised land. The rest of them had died off. And so not only was the blessing delayed, but it was denied for, that, for an entire generation. And I think the same is true of us. Now, I don't want to dwell too much on this uh, in, in talking about the church. But the same, I think, can be said about the United Methodist Church. Now, I grew up a United Methodist. I still have a great love for the United Methodist Church. And I'm grieving over what's happened in the United Methodist Church. But let me give you a brief history of where we've been. And where we are, where we are. In 1968, 
The United Methodist Church was formed by the uniting of the Methodist Church and the Evangelical United Brethren. The united part of our name comes from the Evangelical United Brethren. And so when we came together and united in 1968, um, there was a commission that was on theology uh, that was commissioned, and it was headed up by Albert Outler. We had to decide what our theology was going to be. We had to decide how we would do theology and what it would be and so forth. And so this commission was headed up by Albert Outler. And Albert Outler at the time was the best well-known Wesleyan scholar of the day. Even though he's passed away, he still has a major influence on Wesleyan Methodist theology today. Most everyone, uh, in no matter if it's a liberal or conservative seminary, when talking about and reading about and studying Wesley, we all read Albert Outler. In fact, uh, you know Albert Outler even though you might not know him because if you've had any kind of Sunday school literature in the United Methodist Church, you have read Albert Outler. And so he headed up this commission, and this report was going to come back in 1972 at the next general conference. But this commission was made up just not of Albert Outler but of other people. It was made up of the heads of the agencies in the church and some very liberal seminary professors from two of our most liberal seminaries, Claremont Theological Seminary in California, which today, by the way, not only trains uh, United Methodist pastors, but also alongside United Methodist pastors, trains Muslim imams. Also, another professor from Iliff School of Theology in Denver, which is uh, also a very, very liberal seminary. And so when the report came out, and they presented it to, to the 1972 General Conference, and it was accepted, it essentially made theological pluralism uh, to rule the theology of the church. And so even, and, and the, theological pluralism basically is you believe whatever you want to as long as it fits within four categories, scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. You know that as the Wesleyan quadrilateral. The problem with that is, is that the Wesleyan quadrilateral scripture, tradition, experience, and reason was all put on one level. And so it has been abused uh, throughout since 1972. Uh, Albert Adler came back and said, I regret coining that phrase because scripture is always first. The damage had already been done. The damage had already been done. But in 1972, after that general conference and that the report was accepted, this report was accepted. Time Magazine reported this about General Conference. Time Magazine and the article states that Wesley and the EUB, Evangelical United Brethren Patriarchs, made doctrinal pluralism a major tenet and held to only a basic core of Christian truth. And the article even stated that the United Methodist Church is a case, is a case of great American success story that is going bad. That was 1972, and look how far we come. Many churches are disaffiliating from the United Methodist Church because of that. Here's something interesting. I'm going to get off of this in just a second. Here's something interesting. Most of us we couldn't name uh, all of the ten, all, we can't couldn't name the ten spies that went out into the land. We name Joshua and Caleb, the ones that gave the good report, but most of us couldn't name the ten spies. Most people in the United Methodist Church can't name those two liberal seminaries from Claremont, the two liberal professors from Claremont and from Isla, but yet we know Albert Outler because he's still making a positive influence on the, on the Wesleyan Methodist movement today. And so we can't name the others, but we can name those that have done good. We can't name the ten spies, but we can name Joshua and Caleb. And by, by the way, Caleb got to enter into the promised land 40 years later after this report was given. And when he was almost 90 years old, he told them, I want to go to the place where the giants are. Because if God is with me, even at 90 years old, I believe that if God is with me, I can drive out the giant. That's faith. That's faith. That's faith. So... When we lose our vision, our purpose, because of a bad report, because we believe fake news, what happens? 
We wander in the wilderness. We cast off restraint. And that can be applied to the church. It can be applied to just about everything. To family, to politics, to every area of your life. It leads to blessings delayed and it leads to blessings denied. And if there's one lesson that we can learn from all this, I think it's this. The majority, the majority is not always right. In this case, the ten spies were not right, but the two were. When you hear a bad report, don't take someone else's word for it. Check it out for yourself. Do your own research to come to your own conclusion. Check it out. So let me give you a second danger. A second danger. The first is this. Believing the bad report, believing fake news will cause you to wander. The second danger is this, is, is, is it will cause you to believe a lie, live a lie, which in effect will affect your worldview, which affects every decision that you make. Let me say that one more time. So if you believe the fake news, you believe a lie, then you will live a lie. It affects your worldview, and then that affects every single decision that you make in life. Now, let me show you how this works. So a, a poll came out this week that I saw by YouGov. And listen carefully to some of the questions about how most Americans would answer these questions. Now, think about this and how these answers are influenced by our society and particularly uh, the media, the fake, fake news media, we could say. So here are the questions this, for the, that this poll asked. Number one, what percentage of the United States population is African American? Very simple question, right? So the answer that this poll came back saying, those that took the poll, said that 41% uh, of the population in, in America is African American. You, know, you want to know what the real population is of African Americans in this country? 12%. Here's a second question. What percentage of the United States population is Hispanic? So the answer that came back from the poll is 39%. So people that took the poll believe that 39% of the population of America are Hispanic. You know what the real answer is? 17%. So here's, here's one. Uh, the third question, how many families in America have an average income of over $500,000 a year, half a million dollars a year. Here's what people on the, that took the poll said. 26% of Americans that believe, or the people that took this poll believe that 26% of Americans make over half a million dollars a year. That'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? 26% <laughs> of y'all had uh, $500,000 or more income. But you know what the real answer is? One percent. One percent. Fourth question. I'm going to give you three more questions that, that the survey did. It's a fun question. How many Americans are left-handed? What would y'all say? Half? Less than half? Thirty percent, maybe? No, less than that? You know the poll. Or maybe you did. Maybe I didn't tell you this. Now, here's, here's the answer to this question. Eleven percent. Eleven percent is the real answer. The question that they answered the poll by 34 percent. So, uh, so here, here's another one. How many people in America are vegans, vegetarians? So the poll said that 30 percent of Americans are vegans. <laughs> Tam, you're a vegan, right? <laughs> um, you know what the real answer is? Five percent. 5%. Now let me, give you, let me give you the last two questions. Here we go. Because this is really kind of where we are. So how many transgender people do you think are in the United States? All right. The survey said, are you ready for this? The people who took the survey believe that 21% of Americans are transgender. Do you know what the actual number is? Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Last question. What about gay people? Our country, the church, we spend a lot of time talking about LGBTQ stuff, right? So those who took the poll say, believe that 
of Americans are gay. You know what the real number is? 3%. 3%. Now, I wanted to give you that poll to demonstrate two things. One, to show you how many people in our country buy into fake news. And two, to show that the church, the government, Hollywood, the news media, social media, advertising executives, whoever, just about every segment of our society are making decisions, are making policy and laws and advertising and even movies based on fake news. And the effects on our society have been awful, have been terrible. The Israelites made a bad decision to not go into the promised land because of fake news, and they paid the price, 40 years of paying the price. Now, let me apply that to us today. The, Israel, the Israelites lived under the Abrahamic uh, covenant and the, and the Mosaic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant had to do with, with, with people, population. God would make of Abraham a great nation and, uh, and would give him land and property, right? The promised land. Now, we live today under the new covenant. And what does the new covenant have to do with? The new covenant has to do with the forgiveness of our sins. It has to do with God writing his law on our hearts. It has to do with eternal life in heaven. Jeremiah 31, 31. That's what the new covenant has to do with. The full gospel is this. If you want to be a part of that new covenant, if you want to live under that new covenant and have the benefits of the forgiveness of sins, of having the law of God written on our heart and eternal life in heaven, we have to accept by faith what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, the full gospel. You have to believe that God looked down on sinful humanity and became one of us in the person of Jesus Christ, that he lived a sinless life, that he took on the penalty for our sin, that he died in our place. We have to believe in something called substitutionary atonement, and the picture of that was given in the Old Testament when Abraham took his son Isaac after God had told him to go and take him and sacrifice him. And so when Abraham was ready to sacrifice his son, there was a ram caught in the thicket, and the ram was the, the substitute for Isaac, and that gave us a picture of what Jesus ultimately would do for us. He died in our place. He took on the penalty for our sin. So you don't have to. That's substitutionary atonement. He died on the cross for our sins. That's what that means. And not only that, but he rose from the dead, making it possible that we have new life. And the Bible tells us that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. And then he ascended to heaven and he gave us his Holy Spirit to empower us to be his followers, to be his disciples, in order to be his hands, his feet, and his voice. The Holy Spirit empowers us so that we can do that here on earth. And we have to believe that he's coming back one day. And when he comes back, he's going to judge both the living and the dead. And if our names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, then those will be cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. But if our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, we will get to experience heaven for all of eternity. And there we will be with Jesus forever. But the problem is the full gospel is not being preached today. If you use the YouVersion Bible app, I know many of you do, the YouVersion Bible app, you might have seen the devotion that was given last Wednesday by Max Licata. And the verse of the day last Wednesday was John 1.14. You know the verse, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. And so Max Licato reflected on that verse. And he says that the life and ministry of Jesus was full of both grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace told the adulterous woman, I do not condemn you. Truth told her, go and sin no more. Grace invited a swindler named Zacchaeus to lunch. Truth prompted him to sell half of his possessions and give to the poor. Grace washed the feet of the disciples. Truth told them, do as I have done to you. Grace invited Peter to climb out of the boat and walk on the sea. Truth revealed his lack of faith. 
Jesus shared truth. He shared truth with great, but he shared it great. Jesus offered grace, but he offered it truthfully. So we have to have both grace and truth. And there's a segment in the church today who not who who only want to talk about one of those. There's a segment that only wants to talk about grace. There's a segment that only wants to talk about truth. What makes fake news so appealing and easy to believe is that it has an element of truth to both of them. Fake news is not all a lie. But 1% lie makes it what? All a lie. Preaching and teaching all on grace without truth is not the full, complete gospel. It must include truth. And so, likewise, preaching truth preaching truth without grace is also an incomplete gospel. The danger of preaching on grace without truth leads people to hell. The danger of preaching truth without grace turns the church into judgmental Pharisees. One of the biggest movements in the church today is, is this movement called so-called progressive Christianity. We just finished up a study on Wednesday night talking about this, this very thing. And I don't believe progressive Christianity is Christianity at all. I think it is a whole different religion. Progressive Christianity focuses on grace without truth. Progressive Christianity denies the authority of the Bible as the written, inerrant word of God. It denies the person and work of Jesus. It denies substitutionary atonement. That's why I talked about that in detail this morning, because that's one of the things that it denies, substitutionary atonement, and calls the cross divine child abuse. It denies the historicity of many of the miracles of Jesus, and for some, even the resurrection. It denies the existence of a literal hell. It reduces many of the great stories of the patriarchs of our faith in the Old Testament to nothing more than fairy tales. It affirms universal salvation where ultimately everyone will be saved in the end. So there's no need for hell. Teaching and preaching that affirms these things is fake news and will send people to hell. One of the reasons I'm a Methodist some form of Wesleyan Methodist is because of John Wesley's emphasis on grace. You've heard me preach and teach many times on prevenient grace and justifying grace and sanctifying grace, kind of the hallmarks of our Wesleyan theology. Wesley called it his ordo salutis or his order of salvation. Prevenient grace, the grace of God goes before our experience of salvation at justification when we say yes to to the relationship that God offers us, we are justified. It's just as if I had never sinned. And then we're working towards sanctifying grace or becoming uh, whole and, and perfect in God's in love in this life. That's what we're working towards. That's grace. But with Wesley, he didn't just focus on grace because if you were a part of a Methodist class meeting in 18th century England, you would have heard this question over and over and over again. Do you desire to flee the wrath to come and to be saved from your sins? What many churches today preach is half of that. Do you desire to be saved from your sins? But we never talk about what it is that we need to be saved from. What it is that we need to be saved from is the wrath of God. Sin, death, and hell. God wants to save us. The Greek word sozo from our sins to be protected from the enemy and to be preserved for eternal life that's what God wants to do fake news will keep you in bondage the good news will set you free fake news will steal your vision and keep you wandering in the wilderness the good news will lead you to the promised land fake news will cause you to buy into a lie that says hell is not real, the Bible is not true, Jesus' death on the cross wasn't for your sins, but an example for you to live a sacrificial life. The good news will help you flee the wrath to come, rescue you from your sin, protect you from all of the schemes of the enemy, and preserve you for eternal life in heaven. And so I want to end today's message with John Wesley's question. Do you desire to flee the wrath to come and to be saved from your sins?
The full gospel is this. Jesus came to die on a cross, not to show us an example how to live a sacrificial life, even though we should, but he came to die on the cross for our sins. He died in your place. That's the truth. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John talk about it. The Apostle Paul tells it. The revelation of John makes it more than abundantly clear that if we do not accept what Christ has done for us on the cross, then our judgment is the lake of fire. There's no way to sugarcoat that. That's the truth. That's the truth. The question is, do you want to accept the truth? Or are you... Or are you going to accept the lie of fake news? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have with us in the 66 books of the Bible, the whole gospel, the full truth. All your words are true. And Father, I pray that if any one of us in here has fallen for the schemes of the devil, that if we've fallen for another gospel, a different gospel, that we've fallen for fake news. Lord, I pray that everyone in here today would see the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And that we would leave the lives of this world, the lies of, of progressive Christianity, the lies that have been, that wants to make us feel good behind. But that we will be set free and forgiven of our sins by the truth of your word, the truth of the gospel, the good news. For it is the good news that will set us free. It is the good news that will forgive us of our sins, all of our sins. It is the good news that we can trust, that we can rely on, and that ultimately, when we stand before you on that, on that day, you will say, come on in. Well done, my good and faithful servant. We pray this in Jesus' name.